Uh, so if you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and grab them and turn with me to the book of Nahum. And if you didn't know that Nahum was a book of the Bible, shame on you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's understandable because Nahum is a very small little Old Testament book, only three chapters, uh, which is why it is referred to as one of the minor prophets, not because it is minor in importance, but because it is minor in length. It is a very short Book. And so it's understandable if you've never read it before, but it is a book of the Bible. And if you're wondering where it is, you don't know, it's located right in between the books of Micah and Habakkuk. Okay, and if that doesn't help you very much, just go towards the end of your Old Testament. It's near the end. Okay, you will find this small little book of Nahum. Uh, but today we are actually going to begin a short uh, series through the book of Nahum. And if you're wondering why are we looking at this obscure little book, uh, the reason is actually because this book is considered to be, believe it or not, part two, if you will, of the book of Jonah, uh, which we just finished last week, if you've been with us, okay? Uh, Nahum actually takes place about a hundred years or so after the book of Jonah, okay? And so Nahum is going to show us what will eventually happen to Nineveh just a generation or so after they had experienced such incredible mercy and grace and revival in response to the preaching of Jonah. And so again, we're pretty much looking at Jonah part two, okay, according to the prophet Nahum. Now, normally at the beginning of a series, I'd, I'd usually give us some more background, more um, sort of information, introduction to the book. But today we don't have time, and so we're going to cover that actually next week. Okay, so you're going to have to wait till next week for that. Uh, but for now, just it's enough for you to know that Nahum is really the follow up to the book of Jonah. Okay, and so we're going to go ahead and jump right into the text now, and today we're going to cover the first eight verses. The first eight verses of chapter one. Okay, and so Nahum chapter 1, verses 1 through 8 is our text for today. And what we're going to be focusing on is the question of who, according to the prophet Nahum, the Lord is. Okay, which is actually the title of our message. The Lord is dot, dot, dot. Because we're going to let the prophet Nahum tell us, according to scripture, who the Lord is. And this is actually very important. Okay? And uh, I thought it would be fitting maybe even for our children to learn who the Lord is. Because whenever we ask this question of who the Lord is, we always want to make sure that our definition is coming from the word of the Lord himself. Amen? Because otherwise the Lord can be whoever you want him to be. The Lord can be whoever you imagine him to be, right? We can sort of create a God of your own liking, which, in fact, is what many people do. They create God based on what they want God to be, not according to what God says. Okay? And so it's very important that we find out who the Lord is based on what he says himself, because that is who he is, okay? And so the question is, who does the Lord say he is? What does our Lord say about who he is? That is what we're going to discover in Nahum chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. So let's dive into the text now. This is the word of God. Nahum chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. And we'll read the whole thing because it's not that long. This is the word of the Lord. An oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum of Elkosh. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger. His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. 
But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. This is God's word. Let me go ahead and pray for us. Father, we thank you for your word that is true. We thank you that in your word we can learn about who you are, not who we imagine you to be, not who we think you to be or we want you to be, but who you say you are. And we know who you are is good in all your attributes. And so, Lord, as we read, even though sometimes this is a difficult attribute that we're going to talk about, Father, help us to see that you are good always in all of your ways. And so, Spirit of God, give us understanding, give us open hearts, feed our souls so that our souls would love our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ more and more today. And it's for your glory and our joy we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, now there's a lot of things that this passage teaches us about who the Lord is, but for the sake of time, we're going to focus on just three of them, okay? And so three things or attributes, if you will, of God that we learn from this passage. And the first one is this, and we're going to spend most of our time on this one because it's the main one, okay? And that is verse 2. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. Everyone say he's an avenging God. That's right. If you did not know, now you know God is the OG Avenger. Okay? He is the Avenger. And so when you think about Avengers, do not think Captain America. All right? Don't think Tony Stark or don't think Thor or whoever your favorite Avengers are because the Lord is an avenging God. He is the ultimate Avenger. And this is clearly emphasized here in verse 2 because it is mentioned three times. You probably uh, heard this repetition three times in verse 2. He's an avenging God. He is avenging and wrathful. He takes vengeance on his adversaries. The Lord is an avenging God. That is the point. Okay. Now, before we talk about what this means... Let me just quickly clarify what it means that the Lord is a jealous God, because it also says he's a jealous God, okay? And I know uh, for those of you who did foundations class, shout out to those who did foundations class last week, you already know this. You are an expert at this because you learned it just last week, right? But let me just tell us, because there's a lot of confusion on this, okay? The Lord being a jealous God, it does not mean that he is, you know, way up in heaven looking down on his creation, and just so jealous that you have something that he does not have. Oh, I wish I had her job. Gosh, I'm so jealous about that. Oh, I wish that I was as strong as that guy. Oh, gosh, I wish. No, of course not. That is more like our jealousy, right? That's the jealousy that we exhibit, this sort of bad, prideful, self-centered jealousy. That's our jealousy. No, rather God's jealousy God's jealousy is more like the jealousy that perhaps a good husband might feel when he sees that another man is trying to take his wife away from him. Get away from her. Don't you dare come anywhere near her ever again. She is mine. That is a good jealousy. That is actually a right jealousy because that's his wife, right? She belongs to me. And so the type of jealousy that God has is a jealousy that seeks to protect, seems to preserve what rightfully belongs to him. And what rightfully belongs to God? Well, everything, obviously, right? Everything belongs to God, but specifically here, his people, Israel, those who belong to him. He is jealous for his people, and he will, he says, avenge. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean that God is an avenging God? Well, it's actually very simple. It means no enemy of God is going to go unpunished. None. In other words, there's not a single person who rebels against God, who rejects his commandments, who refuses to worship him, who's going to get away with it. Not going to happen. Ever. Because as it says at the end of verse 3, he will by no means clear the guilty. 
God will punish his enemies. Now, the question is, who are his enemies? Who's that? Who is Nahum talking about here? Well, in the immediate context, again, verse 1, he's talking about Nineveh, isn't he? Because if you were here during the Jonah series, you remember that Nineveh was an evil, wicked nation. And at the time, they are at the height of their power. They are the mightiest nation on the face of this earth, of the earth at the time. And unfortunately, even after having received the mercy and grace of God back in Jonah chapter 3, about 100 years ago, unfortunately, they have now returned to their evil and wicked ways, went straight back to it. Brutally murdering and ruthlessly oppressing the nations around them, especially Israel. So in the immediate context, Nahum is saying Nineveh will not get away with it. God will avenge and punish Nineveh. Now, without a doubt, okay, without a doubt, this was not an easy message to believe. Those listening to this message that Nahum was speaking, it would would have been very, very hard to believe because, again, Nineveh is the mightiest nation on earth, strongest nation. And for well over a century now, they've been doing whatever they want with no one to stop them. They've been getting away, if you will, with their sin. In fact, they're even boasting about their sin. (laughs) Ha, 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 right? Who can stop us? They're doing whatever they want, whenever they want, and to whoever they want. And God hasn't done anything for well over 100 years. Can you imagine that? You ever wondered that before? You ever wondered about this? You ever sort of wondered why it seems like the wicked keep prospering? Maybe you turn on the news and you see wickedness and you see evil and you see just atrocities and you wonder why is that still going on? Or maybe even around you, you, you have people that are immoral in your workplace, just corrupt, always doing evil, always just stepping on other people, just wanting to rise higher. And it seems like they always do. Right? It seems like they always get to the top. They always seem to rise higher. The wicked seem to always prosper. And so if God will no, by no means clear the guilty, why do the guilty keep thriving? Why do they keep rising higher? It's a very common question, actually. A, co- a question that Scripture asks repeatedly. The psalmist even asked this question. And certainly those listening to this message, they would have been asking this question. Why is guilty and wicked Nineveh so prosperous? How could they be the most mighty nation on earth? Why has the Lord not destroyed them by now? Why hasn't he wiped them out? Well, Nahum tells us why. In the beginning of verse 3, look at the beginning of verse 3. The Lord is slow. Everyone say slow. Slow to anger. So yes, he's absolutely furious and angry over sin, and he will not acquit the guilty, but he's also slow to pour out that anger. In other words, he's extremely patient. More patient than you could ever imagine, That is why we are not seeing God unleash his anger and his vengeance upon sin right now. He's slow to anger. In fact, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 talks about exactly this. Even in the New Testament, there Peter, he is addressing these scoffers, these sort of mockers who are asking this question, basically, where's the day of judgment? You talk about a day of judgment. You talk about Jesus returning. But where is this? Everything is going just as it always has. The wicked are just living in their sin, and they seem to be prospering just as they always have. So where is this avenging God you talk about? Where? And in 2 Peter 3, 9, the apostle Peter says this. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. And that promise, he's talking about the return of judgment. He's not slow, but rather is patient toward you. Why? Why is he patient? Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Hallelujah. In other words, the reason God is not bringing judgment upon the earth yet is because he's being patient and kind. Not wishing that any 
should perish, but that all should reach repentance by believing in his son. And so God's patience and his mercy, it is that that is sort of holding back his judgment. But, this is important, but we should not mistake God's patience for his apathy. Don't ever make that mistake. Like, don't ever think that just because it's not happening now or even for a very long time that it never will because it will. God will avenge. And Peter makes that crystal clear in the next verse. He says in 2 Peter chapter 3, 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief when you least expect it. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. In other words, God will bring judgment. You can count on it. He has said this. So again, do not confuse God's patience for his apathy. What God does not do now is not because he cannot do. No, he certainly and positively can And this actually leads us to the second attribute of God that we see from this text. And it's in the very next part of verse 3. Okay? So kids, if you're taking notes, which I know all of you are, this is point two. Okay? Take those notes. (laughs) Second thing is in the very next part of verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. So who is the Lord? The Lord is great in power. Everyone say great in power. And you should do like one of these when you do that, right? Great in power, right? Great in power. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time uh, on this point because, for one, we don't have much time today, uh, but also because it's fairly obvious, isn't it? Fairly obvious point. I mean, this is one of the first things that little children, if you grew up in the church, it's one of the first things that you learn, right? One of the first things that children learn in church is, my God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. I was hoping everybody would do that, right? (laughs) The mountains are his, the rivers are his, the stars are his handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. That's right. Nothing, right? Nothing he can't do. And how do we know this? How do we know this? Well, it's because obviously the very first words of the Bible tell us this. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Talk about power. Talk about great in power. There is nothing my God cannot do. We know this, okay? And so we don't need to dwell too much on this point except to know what Nahum is highlighting here. It's not necessarily God's greatness in power to create, so powerful to create, or even to redeem, so powerful to save, even though, of course, that is true. But here, Nahum is highlighting God's greatness in power to judge. That's what Nahum is highlighting here. He is saying that even mighty, strong Nineveh who at the time no one would have ever imagined could be brought down and destroyed. I mean, what, are, what do you think about, what cities do you think about now, or nations do you think about now that pff, they're going to be around for hundreds of years? America, right? China, whatever it is, right? The greatest nation on earth. Nobody could have imagined it could ever be brought down, but Nahum is saying the Lord could do it with just one word. With just one breath, God could... Pff, Blow down Nineveh to the ground. And that's really what all that poetic language in verses 3 to 5 is pointing to. I'm not going to exposit these verses, but just listen again to all this poetic language that's supposed to show you God is powerful. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea, makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. And if you're wondering about that, those are all places in Israel that that were just uh, very, very fruitful, very, very bountiful, known to be so fruitful. And God's saying, I can wither those places like this. 
Okay? The mountains quake before him, the hills melt, the earth heaves before him, the world and all who dwell in it. So in other words, it does not matter how strong or mighty Assyria may seem to be because the Lord is the one before whom the mountains quake. The hills melt before him. The earth trembles before him. This is the Lord. And this is why the prophet Nahum, he asks in verse 6 this rhetorical question, very important question. You ought to highlight this if you have a Bible or maybe in your electronic ones. Put a highlight there, verse 6. Who can stand before his indignation? Every single person has to answer this question. Who? Who can endure the heat of his anger? It's not a hard answer, not a hard question to answer. Answer? No one. No one can stand before God's indignation. No one can endure the heat of God's anger. No enemy of God stands a chance. No uh, rebel or rival will stand before God. They will all fall, including mighty Nineveh, which we're going to talk about more in the coming weeks. And it's going to be fascinating to hear how this mighty nation went down so fast. It's a historical fact. So we'll talk about more of that in the coming weeks. But here's the thing, okay? I want to move it now to us. It's not only the wicked and evil Ninevites who will not be able to stand before the righteous wrath of God, not just them. It is every single person on the face of the entire earth, apart from believing in Jesus, every person. Because the Bible makes crystal clear every single person has sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. That is Romans 3.23. Every single person, including me, including you. And that means that every single person in our natural state, left to ourself, is an enemy of God. In our natural state, we are enemies of God. Which is actually what the Bible says. Romans chapter 5 verse 10 clearly states this, that it was while we were enemies that we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. We were enemies. And so, all people apart from believing in Jesus are enemies of God because we are all sinners. And so, when you put that and you bring that closer to home, God being an avenging God is bad and troubling news. Not just for the Ninevites, but for all people apart from believing in Jesus. Because again, God will not let sin go unpunished. He's very clear about this. Uh, By no means clear the guilty. I am an avenging God. And so this is really troubling news for all people. But thankfully, we can take a breath now, okay? Thankfully, there is good news, isn't there? And if you're a Christian, you ought to be like, You don't have to say it out loud, but hopefully there's a silent little amen rising up. Thankfully, there is good news. Thank God there is good news. And this leads us to the last thing that we learn about who the Lord is from this text. And it's in verse 7, probably uh, the most comforting and glorious verse. In in the middle of all this, verse 7, it says, the Lord is good. Everyone say good. You ought to say that with a little more passion. The Lord is good. Amen. Amen. Was that Jaden over there? Yeah, amen, okay? (laughs) He's good. He is a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. Hallelujah. (laughs) So yes, no one can stand on their own before God's righteous anger, but for those who take refuge in him, it says he knows. He knows you. And by the way, you ought to know that doesn't simply mean that he knows you like in an intellectual way, like, oh, yeah, I know you. You know, like, we're Facebook friends. You know, I I know your name. I kind of recognize. No, it doesn't mean that. This connotes intimacy, actually. It's actually the same word that is used for a man and a woman joining together to become one when they know each other. It is intimate 
language here. And so, in other words, he knows and he loves those who take refuge in him intimately. He knows you. And not only that, but he's a stronghold, a mighty fortress in the day of trouble for those who trust in him. Why? Why is he all these wonderful things? Well, obviously, because he's good. He's so good. So good that he would send his one and only son to die on the cross to take the punishment for all of our sins so that we would be saved. This is the gospel, is it not? Jesus Christ, he absorbed the wrath of God that we deserve so that we could be saved simply by believing in Jesus. This is the gospel. Through Christ, God takes his enemies, he makes them his friends. He takes condemned sinners and he makes them his righteous, beloved children. This is the good news of the gospel. And so, in closing, we're doing pretty good here. In closing, the application is simple, and I try to keep it as simple and gospel-centered because we have children here, and I see my daughter sleeping. You better wake up, Nora. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Try to keep this very simple for even the children to get what is going, what's the point here? Here's the point. Run to Jesus. (laughs) Take refuge in Jesus as your only hope for salvation. Amen? Amen. Trust and believe in Jesus, believe in his gospel. And if you already have for the Christians in this room, you ought to praise God for Jesus and keep trusting him. Because again, what this passage makes clear is no one can stand before his hot anger. Nobody. There's not a single person who is good enough who is going to stand before God's holy and righteous indignation. And so, very simple application. Again, kids, remember this, okay? If you remember nothing else, remember this. If you run away from the Lord, you will fall. It's very simple. You flee from the Lord, you rebel against him, you will lose because God is an avenging God. Great in power. Nobody can stand before his anger. On, his, on your own, you will not stand. But run towards God. Run towards him. Believe and trust in his son, Jesus Christ. You will stand because God is good. He is a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows and he loves those who take refuge in him. So run to him right now and for all of your days. Amen? And with that, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the good news of the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we know this is only good news when we understand that first bad news that can be so heavy, I know, when we talk about your wrath, when we talk about your anger, it's very heavy. But Lord, if we don't understand that, how can we understand your grace and your mercy that while we were still sinners, you sent your son to die for us so that we would not perish in our sins and have to fall before your holy anger, but we could be saved and adopted into your family and treasured now and forevermore by you. And so we thank you so much for the good news of the gospel. And I know many of us in this room have already received and believed in the gospel. Keep us firmly rooted in your gospel. Keep us celebrating your gospel. Keep us trusting in your gospel and just marveling in it all the days of our life so that our hearts would always long to please you and honor you, and live for your name. And Lord, we also ask that you would help us to share this gospel with others. Because Lord, if if that is true, that no one can stand before your holy, righteous anger, Lord, there are many people around us that need to believe in your gospel. And so help us to share this good news, to be a light in the midst of such a dark and depraved and hopeless world, to shine the light and hope of Jesus Christ, that there is a Savior from sin, and his name is Jesus. Help us for the glory of your name, for the joy of your church, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. All right, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.